Hi, this is Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. In the previous video, Tom Pennington's fourth argument for the cessation of miraculous gifts of the Spirit was the nature of the miraculous gifts. He says that the modern charismatic gift of tongues is ecstatic speech. That was the New Testament gift, speaking in a known language or a known dialect. Compare that with today's tongues, which are ecstatic speech. Ecstatic speech is a bit of a misnomer. It implies that the speaker loses control in a state of ecstasy and begins to speak unintelligible gibberish. Now, while some old-time Pentecostals seem to frequently manifest the gift that way, modern charismatics like me speak in tongues primarily in our prayer lives when we're just seeking God or when we feel inadequate in praying about a situation with our limited human understanding. I'll come back to this point later. In this next clip, he says that modern charismatic healing isn't the same as the healings in the Bible. In the New Testament, when someone with the, with the New Testament gift of healing used his gifts, the results were complete, immediate, permanent, undeniable, every kind of sickness, every kind of illness. The purported healings of today's faith healers are the antithesis of those biblical miracles. They are incomplete, they are temporary at best, and they are unverifiable. He says that healings in the Bible were complete. Well, if you'll recall, Jesus healed a blind man who saw men as trees, Mark 8, 24. So Jesus ministered to him a bit more until his healing was complete. Now, if it took Jesus, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God, if it took Him a couple of tries to bring total healing to this man, it should come as no surprise when people ministering healing today don't bring complete healing on occasion. Then Tom says that biblical healings were immediate. Well, not always. Do you recall the story of the ten lepers in Luke 17? Jesus told them to go and show themselves to the priest. The Bible says, as they went, they were cleansed. The one who returned to thank Jesus for his healing apparently had to travel a considerable distance to do so, that the others weren't willing to travel. Then there was the story of the nobleman's son who was dying with a fever, and the Bible says he began to get better in John 4, 52. Now, if these people healed by Jesus didn't experience immediate healing, we shouldn't be surprised today when some people don't receive immediate healing. Then Tom says that biblical healings were permanent. Well, do you recall when Jesus told the man he healed by the pool at Bethesda to sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you? John 5, 14. Or in Luke 11, 24 through 26, when Jesus said that an unclean spirit might return to its former dwelling place with seven more wicked spirits, leaving the person worse off than they were before. Well, if a person who Jesus healed could end up worse than he was before, it shouldn't surprise us today when people who have experienced healing struggle to maintain it. And then there was the time in Mark chapter 6 when Jesus could do no mighty work in Nazareth because of their unbelief. Now, if unbelief could affect Jesus' ministry, it should come as no surprise when unbelief is a factor in divine healing today. You see, many of our beliefs about biblical miracles are based on our religious traditions rather than on what the biblical text actually tells us. Biblical healings weren't always immediate, they weren't always complete, and they weren't always permanent. Therefore, modern healings aren't necessarily different from biblical healings. Next, Tom says that New Testament prophecy is direct, infallible revelation. New Testament prophecy, then, is direct, infallible revelation. That is not what is called prophecy in the 21st century charismatic movement. Well, then why did Paul say to let two or three prophets speak and let the people judge in 1 Corinthians 14, 29? If they're infallible, then what is there to judge? You see, the New Testament prophet is different from the Old Testament prophet. In the Old Testament, you had kings, judges, priests, and prophets. Do we have kings today in the church? No, because the church isn't a physical nation like Israel. Do we have judges? Well, we do in our judicial system, but not in the church. Do we have priests? Well, some denominations do, but the Bible says that we're a royal priesthood because we can all come directly into God's presence because of Jesus' righteousness that has been credited to our account. 
There is no office of priest listed among the ministry gifts of Ephesians 4.11. So if we don't see Old Testament kings, judges, or priests in the New Testament, why do we consider the New Testament prophets to be the same as the Old Testament prophets? They're not. Old Testament prophets spoke to Israel. New Testament prophets speak to the church. Old Testament prophets spoke about the law and the sins of Israel. New Testament prophets speak unto believers for exhortation, edification, and comfort. Old Testament prophets were seers who saw visions. New Testament prophets are primarily preachers of the gospel, with visions and revelations coming secondary. Old Testament prophets gave people direction. New Testament prophets don't give direction because believers have the Holy Spirit to guide them. They speak more in terms of confirmation and preparation. Old Testament prophets had to be accurate 100% of the time or else they were to be put to death. And as I stated earlier, New Testament prophets are to have their prophecies judged. Why? Because they're capable of error and the believers have the Holy Spirit to help them to discern the spirit of error. As Tom and other cessationists are quick to point out, many charismatic prophecies have been wrong. The Old Testament response is to stone them. Should we stone people today when they make a wrong prophecy? No, I don't think even the most extreme cessationists would condone that, which tells us that they don't really hold a consistent position on this. They recognize that we're not still living under the Old Covenant. So why do they insist on going by Old Testament guidelines concerning the ministry of the prophet? Now don't misunderstand me. It's very important for people to be certain that they're speaking by the Spirit of God when they prophesy. And we charismatics have been far too lenient in this area for my taste. If you have a track record of failed prophecies, you should have zero credibility with the church and you should probably sit on the pew and be discipled for a while. But to insist that there are no prophets today because so-called prophets have been wrong more than they've been right, it's just wrong. Kenneth Hagin was a prophet, and when he ministered under that prophetic anointing, I never saw him miss it. In 1964, he prophesied that the leader of the deliverance movement would die by the end of 1965. He wrote it down in a note and handed it to Gordon Lindsay, who founded Christ for the Nations in Dallas. In December of 1965, William Branham died as the result of an auto accident in fulfillment of the prophecy. The story is told in Frida Lindsay's book, My Diary Secrets, published in 1976. Lester Sumrall tells the story of his association with Howard Carter, one of the founding members of the Assemblies of God in the UK. While he was in England, Carter had heard from God that he would be sent a companion to help him in his ministry to the world. He wrote down the exact words that God told him this companion would say when they met. Sometime later, he was in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, and a young Lester Sumrall walked up to him after a meeting and said the exact words that he had written down. Sumrall went on to describe the phenomenal nature of Carter's prophetic ministry. He just knew things by the Spirit of God about people and events and places to the point that it was actually unnerving at times. Sure, there are false prophets and hit and miss prophets out there, but there are also legitimate prophets who prophesy with amazing accuracy. And now, let's listen to Nathan on speaking in tongues. Early in the session, he says that the early church fathers considered the gift of tongues to be the supernatural ability to communicate in a known human language. If we consider the history of the church, we find that the gift of languages was universally considered to be the supernatural ability to speak authentic foreign languages that the speaker had not learned. In the early church, the writings of Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Gregory of Nazianzus, Ambrosiaster, Chrysostom, Augustine, Leo, and many others support this claim. He then quotes from numerous theologians throughout church history to reinforce that notion. Quote here from John Calvin, commenting on 1 Corinthians 12.10. He says that tongue speakers were in many cases not acquainted with the language of the nation with which they had to deal. The interpreters, those with the gift of interpretation, rendered foreign tongues into the native language. These endowments or gifts, they did not at that time acquire by labor and study, but were put in possession of them by a wonderful revelation of the Spirit.
The names of the reformers or to their names, we could add the names of the Puritans and the names of theologians like Jonathan Edwards, Charles Hodge, Charles Spurgeon, B.B. Warfield, and many others. One thing I've noticed about people like Nathan Boosnitz and John MacArthur and Tom Pennington is their emphasis on the views of other theologians and the reformers in formulating their theology. While the views of theologians throughout church history might be interesting and even thought-provoking at times, We don't take our theology from theologians. As believers, we go by the Bible. What did God say in his word? Now, notice that Calvin was under the impression that tongues were given for the purpose of spreading the gospel. But nowhere in the Bible are we told that tongues were given for the purpose of preaching to people who speak a different language without learning their language. On the day of Pentecost, tongues were assigned to the unbelieving Jews gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. All of these Jews were living in the Mediterranean world where they would have learned Koine or common Greek and probably knew Aramaic too, in addition to their native dialects. When Peter preached to them, he preached in either Greek or Aramaic. So there was no need to preach to them in tongues as they already had a common language. If you know your history, you remember that Alexander the Great conquered the entire Mediterranean world as a young man And afterwards, the Greeks saw to it that their language and their culture became commonplace throughout the empire. Numerous Bible commentaries state that in God's providence, the Greek language had become a universal language, and the Romans made travel easy throughout the region and maintained the peace, Pax Romana, and those things contributed to the spreading of the gospel after Jesus' resurrection. Let's look at what some Bible commentators have said about Galatians 4.4. The Bible Knowledge Commentary, published by the cessationist Dallas Theological Seminary, says, As a human father chose the time for his child to become an adult son, so the Heavenly Father chose the time for the coming of Christ to make provision for people's transition from bondage under law to spiritual sonship. This time was when the Roman civilization had brought peace and a road system which facilitated travel, when the Grecian civilization provided a language which was adopted as the lingua franca of the empire, when the Jews had proclaimed monotheism and the messianic hope in the synagogues of the Mediterranean world. GotQuestions.org is also apparently non-charismatic, and they say, Rome had unified much of the world under its government, giving a sense of unity to the various lands. Also, because the empire was relatively peaceful, travel was possible, allowing the early Christians to spread the gospel. Such freedom to travel would have been impossible in other eras. While Rome had conquered militarily, Greece had conquered culturally. A common form of the Greek language, different from classical Greek, was the trade language and was spoken throughout the empire, making it possible to communicate the gospel to many different people groups through one common language. Countless other commentaries make reference to the fact that the Hellenization of the Mediterranean world provided a sort of universal language, or lingua franca, that made it easy to communicate the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. But oddly enough, When cessationists start talking about tongues, they insist that the gift of tongues was needed to spread the gospel, completely overlooking the fact that Koine Greek was spoken from Rome to Turkey to Palestine to Egypt. Tongues weren't needed to spread the gospel. They were a sign to the unbelievers to arrest their attention so that they would listen to the gospel when it was preached. My point in bringing all of this out is that although the tongues on the day of Pentecost were unlearned human languages, they weren't given for the proclamation of the gospel via those languages. Calvin, Chrysostom, and Augustine were wrong. And those who cite their thoughts on tongues are wrong. In fact, even Charles Fox Parham, who is credited with the birth of the Pentecostal movement, was under the impression that by speaking in tongues, they would be able to preach on the mission field without intensive language studies. I'm guessing that he also got that idea from reading what Calvin and the others said. Parham was an evangelist, and he was excited about the possibilities of missionary evangelism if he and his followers could be empowered to preach in tongues. 
Robert Mapes Anderson says this, S.C. Todd of the Bible Missionary Society investigated 18 Pentecostals who went to Japan, China, and India expecting to preach to the natives in those countries in their own tongue and found that by their own admission, in no single instance have they been able to do so. As these and other missionaries returned in disappointment and failure, Pentecostals were compelled to rethink their original view of speaking in tongues. When it became obvious that Pentecostals speaking in tongues did not consist of human languages, the entire movement was faced with an interesting dilemma. They could uphold their exegetical understanding of tongues, which told them that it had to be real languages, or they could hold on to their experiential understanding of tongues and radically change their exegesis. And that is in fact what they did. Driven by their experience then, the modern charismatic movement was forced to redefine the gift of languages to mean something other than human foreign languages. That is because quite frankly, the modern charismatic gift of tongues does not consist of authentic foreign languages. Now it's true that they weren't able to communicate via tongues on the mission field, and it's true that rather than simply concluding that bib biblical tongues is just unlearned human languages, they changed their understanding of tongues. But what is not true is that the modern charismatic gift of tongues doesn't include authentic foreign languages. I'll get to that in a minute. When the believers who had gathered at Parham's school met just before New Year's Eve 1900 and spent days in prayer seeking the baptism in the Holy Spirit that they read about in their Bibles, something phenomenal occurred as a student named Agnes Osmond began speaking in tongues. Those who witnessed it said that she had a halo around her head and she reportedly couldn't speak or write in English for three days. Now, some people will say that this experience must have been demonic since biblical tongues has passed away or is only unlearned human languages. But Jesus said that if we ask the Father for a fish, he won't give us a serpent. What these people were seeking was holy and biblical. So it's a bit much to insist that they got a demon instead. It's true that her writing wasn't Chinese, but Parham and the others were so convinced of the supernatural nature of what happened that they were willing to take what little money they had and travel to foreign lands to preach in tongues. When they realized that the tongues that they were speaking weren't authentic human languages, they went back to the Bible and began to systematize their theology along these lines. Now let me ask you, how long did it take the church fathers to determine the current orthodox view on the Trinity? Centuries. The fact that it took a few decades for Pentecostals to systematize their current position on the gift of tongues doesn't invalidate that position at all. This happens in every movement. The pioneers get a lot of things wrong and others come along behind them and provide more structure and order and consistency to the belief system. This happened in the Protestant Reformation, it happened in the Holiness Movement, and it even occurred within the denomination that I was raised in, the Southern Baptists who began as a result of a dispute with the Northerners over the issue of slavery. No Southern Baptist today would state their support of slavery, but they did in the 19th century. In fact, Peter and the Apostles ended up tweaking their theology quite a bit after witnessing the resurrected Christ. So the fact that Pentecostals had to do that doesn't invalidate their teaching in the least. The typical cessationist argument is that we shouldn't interpret the Bible based on our experiences, but we should judge our experiences by the Bible. Now that's true to a certain extent, but what about Saul of Tarsus? He was an expert on the law who studied with a top-notch Pharisee named Gamaliel. Saul was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians when he had a supernatural experience. As a result, his theology was drastically altered. Now maybe you're saying, yeah, but he wasn't a Christian at the time, so he didn't know any better. Okay, what about Peter? He was a Christian, and he was the leader of the apostles, and yet he had a supernatural experience that altered his theology regarding the gospel going to the Gentiles. So we do have biblical examples of people who changed their theology as a result of a supernatural experience. You see, no matter how much we think we know, we're imperfect vessels and God has to intervene from time to time to correct our understanding of Scripture. 
We just have to ensure that our experiences and the resulting theology are consistent with God's Word. Now, the thrust of Nathan's argument seems to be that biblical tongues consisted of unlearned, authentic human languages, and modern tongues aren't authentic human languages. Ergo, modern tongues aren't biblical tongues. Sounds pretty logical, right? So what we continuationists need to do is establish a couple of things. First, biblical tongues consisted of more than just authentic human languages. And second, modern charismatic tongues include authentic human languages. Now, were biblical tongues only unlearned human languages? If so, why would Paul pray in an unlearned human language? The tongues spoken in Acts 2 were obviously spoken to men, but the tongues Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 14 2 are spoken to God. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God. For no man understands him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. If you're speaking to God, why would you need to speak a human language? You wouldn't. If no man understands you, then how could it be an authentic human language? Then in verse 4 he says this, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. The Greek word for edify is oikodome, which means to build up. It's the same verbiage used in Jude 20 when he said, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. You see, you edify yourself by speaking mysteries in the Spirit to God. In Romans 8.26, Paul says, Likewise the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Dr. P.C. Nelson was a Greek and Hebrew scholar, and he stated that the Greek actually means cannot be uttered in articulate speech or regular speech. In other words, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray with words that we can't express with our understanding. We need supernatural praying when we reach the limitations of praying with our native language with the understanding. Now, Jesus said that believers, not just apostles or first century believers, believers would speak with new tongues. He didn't say that they would speak unlearned human languages. While new tongues could certainly include unlearned human languages, that are new to you, it wouldn't preclude non-human languages. Paul mentioned the tongues of men and angels in 1 Corinthians 13.1. The tongues of angels wouldn't be unlearned human languages. Now, the cessationists insist that Paul was merely using hyperbole here, and that he was only making the point that even if you could speak angelic languages, it would profit you nothing without love. In fact, John MacArthur goes so far as to say, There is no evidence in Scripture that angels use a heavenly language in his book, Charismatic Chaos. Now, while I certainly concede Paul's point about eternal virtues like love taking precedence over temporal spiritual gifts, I don't concede the point that angels don't have a language. We know that the angels were created first, so they existed before any human language existed. Did they speak? It certainly appears that they did, because they sang and worshipped God. In Job 38, verses 4 through 7, we see that the angels sang and shouted for joy. Now, were they just singing notes, or were they also singing words? We know that Lucifer was an angel, and before the creation of man, he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, Isaiah 14, 14. While the text reads that Lucifer said this in his heart, Jesus told us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it would stand to reason that there was a language that he used. Now, since there were no human languages at the time, we have to conclude that this was a language that the angels spoke. Even Matt Slick from CARM, the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, says, it seems obvious from Scripture that angels have languages. So we've established the likelihood that angels had, and still have today, a language that they speak. So was Paul just using hyperbole here? Or could we take this to be a reference to the potential of speaking a literal angelic language? I don't think you can be too dogmatic about either view, but there clearly seems to be the implication that believers can speak non-human languages. I think it's possible that God gives every one of us our own unique language to use in prayer. I've listened to Kenneth Hagin speak in tongues, 
and he used the F and TH sounds frequently, which I never hear with my tongues. He also ended phrases with consonants from time to time, whereas I always seem to end phrases with vowels. Others sound completely different. My point is, the new tongues that Jesus spoke of may very well be an all-encompassing term for every manifestation of tongues, for a sign, for public assembly when an interpreter is present, for private devotions or intercession or whatever. But you will never hear unlearned human languages spoken by somebody who doesn't believe in speaking in tongues. One reason we don't see tongues as a sign frequently manifested in America is that this is a large country with a common language. You can drive from Florida to Washington State or Maine to California and pretty much communicate with only one language. Try that in Europe or Africa. The same is true for most of Latin America. For the most part, the Americas don't have the language barriers that the Eastern world has. Our friends in the UK often chide Americans for their inability to speak more than one language because it's very common there to speak two or three languages, seeing as how France is right across the English Channel and Germany is right next door to them. And then on the other side, you've got Spain and then Portugal. Another reason we don't see tongues used as a sign very often is that America has historically been a Christian nation. Now, that might be changing in the 21st century, but for most of the country's history, there was no great need to convince people of the truth of the Bible's message. The challenge was in getting people to choose to live by it. Still, there have been cases of Pentecostals speaking known human languages via the gift of tongues. In this clip, John Bevere tells the story of a staff member who spoke French without studying it. One time I was preaching here in Colorado Springs. One of my staff members was in the back of the church. While I was preaching, she thought she was praying in tongues. The whole time I was preaching, she just felt this urge to pray in tongues. When the service was over, a gentleman stood up who was a couple rows ahead of her, and he turned around and said to her, your French is perfect. Not only do you speak French perfectly, but with a perfect accent of the ancient dialect of French. He said, I'm a French teacher and I've never encountered somebody speaking so well as you. She said, I don't speak French. He said, you're kidding me. She said, no, I don't speak French. I can say poly vous français, but that's it. He said, you were speaking perfectly. It was a sign to him. He, then he looked at her and he said, not only that, you were quoting in French scriptures and he would then say, turn to your Bibles to that scripture. You quoted it before he said it. Over the years, I've heard similar stories from others who spoke Spanish, Chinese, and other languages that they had never learned, especially on the mission field where there was more opportunity to see tongues as a sign to unbelievers. Nathan pretty much made his whole case based on biblical tongues being unlearned human languages. The fact is, even if 99.9% .9 of modern charismatic tongues is nothing more than babbling, that still allows for the modern usage of tongues as an unlearned human language as a sign gift. Nathan made no argument against that other than saying that all evidence of such tongues is anecdotal. He offered no proof text to support the position that tongues as a sign gift have ceased. In this next clip, Nathan says that linguistic experts dismiss tongues as legitimate languages. When professional linguists study modern glossolalia, they come away convinced that contemporary tongues bear no resemblance to true human language. This is the equivalent of citing an evolutionary biologist or cosmologist to debunk creationism. Nathan's boss, John MacArthur, has stated emphatically that the world was created in six days. Now, what do you think the experts would say about that? In this one session alone, Nathan cited church fathers Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Gregory of Nazianzus, Ambrosiaster, and Chrysostom, theologians Augustine, Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Hodge, Charles Spurgeon, Norman Geisler, his boss, John MacArthur, Robert Thomas, Thomas Edgar, Richard C. H. Lenski, and B. B. Warfield, Seventh-day Adventist Gerhard Hazel, Charismatics Wayne Grudem, D. A. Carson, Adrian Warnock, Sam Storms, Jack Hayward, and David Moore, historian Robert Maves Anderson, linguistics expert William Samarin, and the Encyclopedia of Psychology and Religion. As believers in Jesus and the Word of God, 
We don't go by what scientists say, but by what the Bible says. We don't go by what the church fathers said. We go by what the Bible says. We don't go by what the reformers and theologians have said. We go by what the Bible says. Jesus said that believers would speak with new tongues. He didn't say that first century believers would speak unlearned human languages. Paul said that there are diverse kinds of tongues, 1 Corinthians 12.10. He didn't say that the gift of tongues is only unlearned human languages. Paul said that when you speak in tongues, you speak divine mysteries to God that no man understands. He didn't say that you speak unlearned human languages to foreigners. Paul also said that these miraculous gifts were given to the church for the edifying of the church until perfection comes. He didn't say that miraculous gifts would cease when the New Testament canon is completed. I could have covered a lot more material on this subject, but this video is already long enough and I have to stop somewhere. I do plan on writing a book on continuationism in the near future, so be watching for that. In the meantime, consider this. The Strange Fire Conference presented their best case for cessationism with these two brothers, and neither of them based their arguments on the one verse in the Bible that says that tongues will cease. Six of Tom Pennington's seven arguments are dismissed with relative ease. The main case they presented is that modern charismatic tongues aren't the same as biblical tongues, just as they claim that modern healings aren't the same as biblical healings. I believe that I've established that modern charismatic tongues are consistent with biblical tongues, even if many charismatics haven't used them properly or haven't always fully understood them. Joel said that in the last days, God would pour out His Spirit on all flesh, and we are clearly living in the last days. Let's not resist what God is doing. Let's welcome the move of His Spirit along the biblical guidelines that He has provided for us so that the gospel can go forward in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. Thanks for watching.